Uh, dear all, welcome to the Animate Library Talks. We will wait for a couple of seconds, waiting for everyone to, uh, to join the talk, and we will start in a few minutes. So dear all, welcome again to the Anamed Library Talks, organizing collaboration with Anamed Library and the History Foundation. Today's talk is entitled Mar Maritime Archaeology, Questions, Answers, and Everything in Between. Uh, we are hosting three distinguished scholars. The talk will be given by Matthew Harpster, Michael Jones, and it will be moderated by Athena Tracadas. This talk will be about maritime archaeology, the significance of understanding the past and the human relationship with the sea. And it will also discuss the difference between maritime, nautical and underwater archaeology and many more aspects of this field will be discussed. Before we start the discussion, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Mathieu Harpster is the director of Kudar, the Koch University Mustafa Koch Maritime Archaeology Research Center. He completed his PhD at the Texas A&M University and held a postdoctoral position at MIT. Previously, he was director of the Kirania Shipwreck Collection Restoration Program. Afterwards, he did research posts at the University of Birmingham as a Marie Curie Fellow. And since 2016, he is in Istanbul at the Koch University. Michael Jones is a maritime archaeologist. His research focuses on the development of shipbuilding and maritime trade in Eastern Mediterranean in late antique and medieval periods. He completed his BA at Boston University, MA and PhD at the Texas A&M University. He has participated in uh, various archaeological research projects in Turkey, including Uluburun shipwreck, um, the Theodosian Harbor site at Yenikapı and conducted several other archaeological survey in Turkey. And the moderator of the talk, Athena Trakadas, is a maritime archaeologist. She received her PhD from the University of Southampton. She is currently visiting scholar at the National Museum of Denmark. Uh, she has directed archaeological projects in various countries. She recently was the Honor Frost Foundation Visiting Professor at the Center for Maritime Archaeology at Alexandria University in Egypt. She is also the co-editor of the Journal of Maritime Archaeology and co-chair of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network. Um, last but not least, dear audience, um, this talk is being recorded. Your microphones are muted and the cameras are off. You may type your questions in the chat sections and it will be answered at the Q&A session. Um, so thank you all for being here. And now I'm passing the word to Athena Trakadas. Great, thank you very much, Natalie. And thank you to our hosts uh, for the Onamed Library Talks. And thank you also um, to our our panelists today, to Mike and to Matthew, and also to our audience. Thank you for being with us on this Tuesday. And hopefully uh, over the next hour or so, we'll be able to um, introduce you to maritime archeology. span um, There's even some people maybe in archeology span who are more curious um, about this subdiscipline. So I hope you'll learn a little bit more. Uh, and maybe at the end of this um, talk today, you'll be interested in learning even more, hopefully. Uh, and as Natalie said, the questions will be, uh, I'll ask them um, uh, at the end of the, the talk today, but if I see one pop up that might be immediately relevant uh, to the subject we're talking about, I'll, I'll ask that as well. So firstly, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Matthew, uh, what really is maritime archaeology? There's a lot of archaeologists who uh, ask me that question and say, what do you guys really do? What 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 is it about your field? Is it a field? Is it a subdiscipline? Is it archaeology? 
how would you define maritime archaeology? Yeah, that's, I get similarly tricky questions, and I suspect many of us have been asked about finding Atlantis as well, somewhere in the Mediterranean. Um, so far, no one has asked me about dinosaurs yet, however. I mean, I suppose, let me find an image actually. I suppose the best way to describe maritime archaeology is to actually kind of show you a picture instead. And sorry, we're going to be moving around a bit. There, can everyone see this? This is something I use in some of my introductory classes. And maritime archaeology, as you could say, is not the only thing we do, or it's the only sort of investigation we do. So some individuals do what we call archaeology underwater. And that's something you could say is defined environmentally. So that's archaeology that's obviously practiced underwater. But it could be an investigation of a shipwreck, or it could be an investigation of a submerged landscape from the prehistoric period. It could even be the investigation of a landscape that sank due to changes in, ge changes in geology, volcanic reasons, or just sedimentation. Now, similar to that, but not necessarily the same, is nautical archaeology. Now, all three of us, as you probably heard, we all received some of our training at Texas A&M University. And at A&M, they focus on nautical archaeology. And that means that they're telling us a lot about ships, ship construction. We're thinking a lot about shipwrecks. And so that means that in some cases, people are doing nautical archaeology underwater. But some individuals can also do nautical archaeology on land because they're still looking at the history of the ships, how the ships are built. They're still looking at material about naval ac activity. From my perspective, maritime archaeology encompasses these two things, but it also has a broader perspective. Uh, what I like to talk about here on campus is that we're thinking about the relationship between people in the sea, and we're using material data, the archaeological record, to learn more about that relationship. So we could be looking at material underwater, we could be looking at boats, but we could be looking at material on land as well. We might even be talking to uh, current individuals within maritime communities. We could even be doing ethnographic studies as well. So I, there's no easy way to explain what maritime archeology span is, but just to simply say that it is many things all at the same time. But we're trying, from my perspective, we're trying to understand that relationship between people and the sea. Okay, and what about you, Mike? What, what do you uh, use as a explanation for colleagues and friends and students when you need to tell them what you do and why you've spent so many years doing it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have a, a, a similar definition, you could say. Uh, actually, when we were talking about kind of an outline for this, uh, talk, I, I looked at some definitions uh, from some, uh, you know, well-known uh, maritime and nautical archaeologists on this. And uh, there's a lot of overlap, and there's a lot of overlap with what uh, Matthew said. Uh, but everybody has a slightly different definition, I think, in terms of uh, where it where it ends and, and uh, where it starts. So, so nautical archaeology, uh, I looked at uh, Keith McElroy and George Bass and uh, Sean McGrail, and they all agree it's basically about ships and watercraft. And uh, like Matthew said, it's, it, it, it could be underwater, it can be on land. Uh, I would add things like historic ships that have been preserved in museums or ethnographic connect collections, things like that. Um, and uh, usually, you know, the ships, the crews or the cargoes. And uh, I usually say uh, maritime archeology span is about, uh, it could be about uh, coastal features that are related to seafaring that are not uh, necessarily uh, shipwrecks. So, you know, you could have, uh, you know, fish weirs for fish traps or, or artificial harbor works or, or areas where, you know, uh, like activity areas. You could have uh, fish processing areas like things Athena has worked on uh, for, you know, garum production and you know, for uh, fish sauce in the Roman era, uh, things like that. So, uh, uh, and there's, there's a little bit of disagreement on uh, coastal communities and things like that, because uh, Keith McElroy, he says that uh, it's a, 
it, it can kind of get too big at that point because then you're looking at, at settlement archaeology and, and uh, that sort of thing. Another, um, so Harbors, George Bass, uh, he, he classifies it in, in with uh, uh, nautical archaeology and I think others might put that more in maritime archaeology. Uh, I was looking at the, in the Oxford Handbook of Maritime Archaeology writes about that. So he says, yeah, it should go in there because you have things like ship sheds where, you know, where you bring your ships out to maintain them. Uh, and uh, the distinction about underwater archaeology, I think that's one of the, the big uh, areas where if, if you're practicing it, there's a little confusion with that sometimes because underwater, you can have underwater sites that, you know, they're submerged today that aren't necessarily uh, heavily maritime. If you think of cenotes and the, you know the Maya, Maya Central America, where they drop offerings into them and things like that, so it's it's a little more distant from what we're doing. But uh, but uh, yeah, so so that's that's basically what I go with. I'd also um, and there, there are just many different methods to to study that. And uh, so that's uh, that's a really good introduction. It really gives a sense, I think, of how broad the field is, right? Mm. And I always think about uh, the World Bank definition or the World Bank um, statistic of how many of the world's population lives within what they call the coastal zone, which is defined variously as either 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers to the sea. Um, and it's, it's something like, it's, it's a ridiculous amount. It's over almost 70% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastal okay. zone. And so when you think about it, um, a lot of things, uh, everyday activities we not, may not think about um, are actually affected by the sea. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a, a, a huge definition. And also what you're pointing out too is um, how some sites might be ships end up on land. There's always that kind of classic, wonderful kind of romantic um, vision of the skeleton coast of Namibia. Uh, in Southwest Africa, right? Because of the changing coastline, um, some huge cargo ships that are maybe only went aground on a sandbar a hundred years ago are now a hundred kilometers inland in a, in a desert. Um, and, and Mike, you excavated a site in Istanbul, which was once underwater, but like you said, it's Yenikapa is now, it was a harbor, it's now a metro station. <laughs> and it was on land, it's, you excavated on land. Um, yeah, I can, I can show a, a picture. Yeah. That'd be great, yeah. And at the same time, now that you excavated a shipwreck underwater, as, as yeah. most people might, might think we're doing. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so this is, this is uh, the shipwreck I wrote my dissertation on. This is YK-14. And so this was excavated by the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. And I worked with uh, Jamal Pulak of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology. Uh, so he was kind of cooperating as a as a kind of on-site expert and so he'll uh, he's going to publish he's in charge of the publication of the final uh, of eight of these shipwrecks there were uh, 37 found and uh, I mean this is what it looks like when it was found because uh, the this is basically in waterlogged sediments so the the ships were were covered very quickly by sand this was probably this is marine sand primarily uh, so there may have been a storm or something that covered this up uh, in, a, in a relatively short period of time uh, it's interesting because you can see this is while it was still being excavated. So there's no clear cargo in here. So, so we wonder if it may have been salvaged actually. Uh, so, uh, and you can see there's a, uh, you can see the, a balk here where you have the stratigraphy of the, of the hull. So there's little bits of pottery, but that seems to be just material that was uh, mixed in. Uh, and, uh, so this is actually, this kind of situation is actually fairly common in urban areas, especially with things like subway projects in ancient cities, because, uh, this was the Theodosian Harbor that through the Byzantine Harbor for the city. And, uh, there is, uh, it was used for, for, you know, centuries, basically the fourth century till at least the, the 12th century. And, uh, over time it kind of filled up with, with, with sediment and garbage and things that people had kind of dropped in there. And, and some of the things included shipwrecks and occasionally there seems to have been uh, kind of catastrophic events that sank them. But uh, this is preserved because it's under the water table and uh, because it was filled up very quickly. So, uh, and I, I think one other important point about this is that this was a, a rescue excavation or a salvage excavation. So they're, they're doing, you know, major infrastructure work that was needed for the city. And uh, so, I mean, if you've, 
uh, tried to get around Istanbul before the metro. It was, it was a little more difficult. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, but this was this was geologically this was the best place to to dig because it was you know sandy sediments and, and you know silt basically. But uh, and then you have all this archaeological material. So. Uh, so the archaeology museum and, and everybody involved had a very difficult uh, situation where they had to kind of scramble and figure out what to do with all of this. And uh, so, so I think, uh, but it, they're really important finds, and I think uh, some of the best finds actually end up being accidental. So, so this is an example. So, yeah, and just to add to what Michael said, I mean, he mentioned how these are very common finds, and that's really, really true. We see similar examples to this kind of work in Naples, when they were similarly building a new metro station near the main train station. A similar thing happened in the city of Pisa. Again, they're building a new train station. They find ancient Roman ships right there in the mud. And if anyone's joining us from North America, there was also a good example in Manhattan, I think it was, on the island where they were digging out the foundations of a building and there was a ship of exploration right there sunk in the mud. And so as much as we like to think that when we do maritime archeology span or underwater archeology, span as much as we like to think that we're being as scientific as we can and systematic and careful, very often a lot of what we find happens just through chance and luck. It's situations like this. And very often, like Yeni Kappa, they become wonderful opportunities. Great, and I, I think that's exactly the, the point if you, you focus on when you're saying maritime archeology, span it's um, these, are, these are sites you're talking about, the ones in Naples and Pisa and Yeni Kappa, and the, it's the World Trade Center shipwreck when that's they built the original World Trade Center or the, uh, back in the, early 80s, they excavated that shipwreck. Mm -hmm. um, but we have one, uh, I think a relevant question from one of our audiences asking also about, we've used the term maritime, we've used the term nautical, we've used the term underwater. What about uh, riverine and lacustrine environments, so lake environments? Um, would you consider that um, part of the broader field as well? Um, Matthew, could you answer that one first? Uh, I mean, if we're talking about maritime archaeology, then yes, I would definitely say it's maritime archaeology because from my perspective, we're thinking about that relationship, as I say, with the sea. But again, it's how do people work with the marine or the maritime environment? So lakes, rivers, to me, that, that is all part of the work we can do. Uh, yeah, I think... Uh... Well, I was, I was looking at these other authors, and, they, and, and several of them agreed that it also should include rivers, but they, they're kind of vague about it. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'd say, sure, why not, as long as it's archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, but, you know, per, a, a good scientific research question. I mean, where the boundaries go, I mean, if you think also, if you're including kind of maritime trade goods and, and maritime archaeology, you know, how far inland does it stop being maritime archaeology? It's a kind of, you know, it's... It can get a little um, hair splitting, I guess. So, yeah. but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think so, especially when you're looking at watercraft and uh, inland watercraft are always really interesting that they're traditional types because they they have these kind of archaic styles that last uh, really into modern times, and you can see how you know prehistoric boats were built, or you know, with, with very, often with very little modification. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you get you know, skin coracles and, and log boats and all kinds of things. So, so those, are, those are very interesting, actually, and they're very helpful for uh, maritime nautical archaeologists, I'd say. So, so that's probably worth studying. So. Right, and some of the, uh, when we think about some of the river environments that exist in the world, if we think about the Nile, that's almost a, you know, a system within itself. It's so big oh, that's and yeah. one of, you know, the world's most complete oldest ships is, is from the Nile, the, the Kiops or the Khufu barge, which just right. got a new home this year. Mm -hmm. Not too much fanfare. So that one uh, also is a good example. Um, and a lot of rivers, they flow into the sea and they are in tidal zones, right? So the sea very much affects their, uh, their environment and drives their kind of uh, daily cycles. Right. That's that's a, yeah, a good yeah. point. And there's been some great excavations done in Switzerland in the lakes of Switzerland where there's excellent preservation. 
uh, as well. Uh, and like you mentioned, Mike, the cenotes in uh, Mexico are now being investigated, these freshwater um, uh, sources, the springs, you could say, that are in the limestone gaps of the uh, peninsula, especially in the Yucatan. Um, these are some, some great introductions. I hope our audience is getting a sense of, of what we do as maritime archaeologists. Um, and one of the things I wanted to um, ask about was you mentioned, Mike, um, Keith McElroy, you mentioned Sean Grail, and you mentioned mm -hmm. John Grail. Mm -hmm. And just briefly, uh, if, before we go on, if you could maybe just give a, a quick overview of why those three names are important to, to our field of maritime, nautical, underwater archaeology. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, George Bass, uh, he's, he's uh, very famous in Turkey because he uh, excavated the uh, Cape Caledonia shipwreck in 1960 uh, back in the graduate school with uh, Peter Throckmorton and, and uh, a number of others who became uh, very well known. Uh, and uh, so he's, he's really the first in Turkey to excavate a shipwreck using kind of archaeological methods underwater. And, and they sort of, and, uh, he had uh, uh, very kind of minimal experience and he found a very important shipwreck at that Geladoni, which is uh, from 1200 BC. And uh, uh, well, he, the, uh, actually, well, the local sponge divers really found it. And so he kind of got news from others and, and found that. So uh, they, they were the best source of information for a lot of this. So, so that was really the beginning of, of uh, nautical archaeology uh, as a sort of systematic discipline underwater. And before that, there are kind of earlier attempts and a lot of things are on land. There's studies of harbors and, and uh, uh, various, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, and so he went on and he founded the Institute of Nautical Archaeology and, uh, at uh, Texas A&M University. And he was very influential and trained a lot of archaeologists. And uh, so the other two I mentioned were uh, Keith McElroy and Sean McGrail. And they're, uh, they were working uh, kind of in Northern Europe primarily. Uh, and uh, they've uh, worked on a, a number of uh, you know, important uh, kind of Northern European shipwrecks. And... <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's uh, so there, there's a different kind of uh, tradition in the north. You have it in uh, England, and then you also have the kind of Scandinavia, and uh, with uh, Ole Krumlund Peterson, and uh, so uh, Sean McGrail worked a lot on uh, kind of Romano-Celtic ships in particular, uh, and which is a, a style where they uh, it's kind of uh, in the the northern provinces where you have. Uh, a mixture of, of indigenous sort of uh, ancient Celtic construction uh, with some Roman influence uh, and it kind of goes into the uh, you know, early medieval period. So, and uh, he's published a number of uh, kind of important books on that. So, um, so uh, yeah. Matthew, did you want to add anything uh, about uh, those three or any other uh, early uh, names you could say in the field um, maybe relevant also we talked about George Bass's relevance to Turkey but there's been uh, some other names maybe um, that you'd like to maybe mention that were important to or are important to the field well I, I think in general beyond just the area of Turkey I think we could also mention Honor Frost we can mention Joan Duplat Taylor you know, because these are all individuals, when we're talking about uh, Sean McGrail, Keith McElroy, George Bass, when we're thinking about Honor Frost, Joan Duplatt Taylor, from my perspective, these are individuals that play very key roles in the creation of our discipline. And as Michael mentioned, George Bass excavated Geladonia in 1960. And I know there's always sort of a pedantic argument about precisely when we could say maritime or nautical archaeology started, but generally we can say at some point in the middle of the 20th century, because that's when we have individuals like George applying scientific archaeological methods underwater. But it's important to remember that all of these individuals, in a way, they're creating this discipline almost out of nothing. This is an entirely new idea. You know, when we have Jacques Cousteau and Emile Gagnon creating scuba equipment, 
they open up the ability to go underwater much more easily than with a hard hat diving suit. And it was individuals like all of these that recognize the academic and the scientific potential. And so I guess on the one hand, I want to emphasize what I just said previously, that they were really creating what we do really out of nothing. But simultaneously, it's also important to remember how young this discipline is. You know, when we're talking about Keith McElroy or Honor Frost or George Bass, these are individuals that many of us have met. These are individuals that we've had the opportunity to talk with and interact with at conferences. And so the discipline is still very young. In a way, I think we kind of feel like we're the, I'm not sure the right generational definition. Are we the grandchildren of these individuals? I'm not quite sure where to put us, but that's really where we are. Right, and, and unfortunately, we lost two of those names, George Bass and Sean McGrail, just this year. Um, yeah. So, uh, and Keith McElroy, unfortunately, died uh, tragically very, very young. Uh, but he uh, contributed a lot to our field that I think we all, and all three of them, um, their, their publications are something that I think we all go back to again and again uh, and really have uh, used our students to define what we do and, and to teach them about our field. Yeah. So this, I think hopefully this is giving people a good idea of, of what we do, but we've, we've touched upon it a little bit, but um, going on to the, the next larger question of thinking about um, why, why is maritime archeology, span and we'll use that term uh, in the broadest sense, why is maritime archeology span important? Um, what can we learn about the past from investigating data from maritime sites. Um, Mike, can you take this and build upon it? Uh, what do we learn? Uh, well, there's, uh, it, 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 you can learn a lot actually, because uh, I mean, it, it goes back to uh, prehistory really. I mean, you can see uh, how humans ad adapt to their environment and how they, they spread. I mean, I think, uh, uh, in modern times, I, I think a lot of people don't realize how much people moved around in antiquity. And so it's, it's uh, you know, people had to uh, move and they're very adaptable. Uh, so we were talking about sort of inland watercraft and, you know, how they can be simple and archaic. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're ineffective or, or primitive or anything like that. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we have evidence for people moving, you know, across the Mediterranean and we're probably log boats or skin boats or things like that in the Neolithic. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, important. Uh, I think also if you're looking at something like the history of urbanism uh, in a place, it, you know, say the Mediterranean, for example, but this, this goes to other areas too. Uh, most uh, cities, you get to a certain point and they can't really support themselves with, uh, with the, the land, you know, agricultural land around the, the hinterland, around the city itself, you know, sort of its, its suburbs and things. So they need to start importing food. And so you start to get uh, trade networks build up. Uh, you need to, they need to import uh, various things as you get more complex societies. So as they start to use uh, metals, you need to import metals. And so one of the things we see a lot of in the Bronze Age is, is long distance importation of copper and tin. Uh, and a lot of that's done by sea, particularly by the late Bronze Age. Uh, and, uh, you know, you see commodities like, like wine, olive oil, grain, things like that. So that those are, you know, very important for the ancient Mediterranean. And then some you don't always find a lot of in, in the archaeological record. You know, people move around, you know, timber, slaves, livestock, things like that. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're, they're finding genetic studies where they, they had one at Tiran's and they found uh, pig bones that could be traced to uh, an Italian population of pigs from the uh, 11th century BC. So we're starting to get results where we can uh, trace uh, animals moving around long distances. So uh, there's uh, so really uh, the development of societies uh, in general. You know, it's it's uh, very closely related to to uh, maritime activity. And then, of course, if you're talking about the last 500 years, of course, where you have uh, kind of European expansion across the globe and colonialism, and that's, that's all very maritime based, uh, too. So you can sort of pick a period and find uh, connections in some way, I think. So. Right. And Matthew, uh, what would you uh, consider then uh, important? Why is maritime archaeology important? And 
what can it, what can the study of the data sets that we get the, and then the materials that we study in maritime archeology, span how can it help our understanding of the past and maybe well, even well, the present and future? I mean, as soon as you asked that question, I started making a list and like Michael's answer, my list is still not finished. Like it's, it's, it's just a, like, I'm at, I suppose anything that we could learn from doing archeology span on land, we can learn from doing archeology span underwater, investigating this relationship with the sea. And, you know, Michael's answer was great. He, you know, we can learn more about migration, trade, the movement of peoples, um, Another element that we could add to it is that generally with sites underwater, we have very different levels of preservation. So many of you might have seen that we have the remains of the ship's hulls, but we also have other types of organic materials. So on um, the shipwreck from Mary Rose, for example, a 16th century site that went down in the Southern England, we have leather shoes preserved from the shipwreck. Uh, if we look at other sites, Michael mentioned the organic material like pig bones. So we have a collection of organic data that we can withdraw from sites underwater that we can't necessarily find on land unless it's exceptional circumstances. But I think we can also think about you know, not, not simply changes in sea level, but we can think about the fact that if we start doing broad scale studies of the seabed, we can start to see that not only has the sea level changed, we can see how people have used the environment and lived in this space in a very different way. So there are wonderful examples off the coast of Italy that there are prehistoric environments that are now under you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 meters of seawater. There's a, other good examples in the North Sea of prehistoric landscapes that are now completely submerged and they can only be found with very expensive high-tech submersibles and remote sensing equipment. And so I think another way of thinking about doing archaeology underwater is that it's giving us an entirely different perspective of what the world was like 7, 10, 15,000 years ago. It, it, it can tell us that people had a very different cartography of the space around them. But I think another thing we can also think about, and again, I always go back to this relationship between people and the sea, is that maritime archeology, span even if when we do it on land, it can give us an idea of that human relationship with the sea. When people were interacting with it, was the sea, was the lake or a river, was it a source of danger? Was it a threat? Did the sea represent a leisure and tourism? Or did the sea become a place for natural resources or luxury items? And so these are all questions that I know we can ask when we're doing archeology span on land, but they're also questions we can ask when we're investigating coastal environments, underwater environments, or the very deep seabed. Great, and it's also, like you're saying, it then touches upon people's individual cultures relationships to the sea and how they perceive the, the maritime space and what one culture might consider dangerous and unknowable. Like we think about the Straits of Gibraltar, right? That was for the, for the Greeks, especially that was originally considered the point of no return. If you sailed out in the Mediterranean um, to the Straits of Gibraltar, Right, you were into the, the wild unknown, yet there's Polynesian seafarers in the Pacific who definitely sailed out into the unknown and came back and knew how to get around. And they have this kind of expression of the maps that are preserved from uh, the Polynesian seafarers um, are amazing. These kind of uh, made out of sticks and stones and feathers and string, um, their, their own internal uh, understanding of, of their navigated spaces that they work through. Yeah. <laughs> and especially thinking even of going back to Egypt, we touched upon, you know, it's this north-south flow of the Nile um, being, uh, that was kind of the orientation, north-south orientation of, of people's uh, daily lives, east and west as well, life and death. And the annual uh, flooding of the Nile was such a huge event for um, the livelihood because it gives uh, water to all the um, it's the foundation for water, the foundation for agriculture in, in this very dry environment, as well as then all the ships that people sailed 
back and forth across the, the wider uh, waterways. Um, one of the things um, that we talked about in preparing this uh, panel discussion was thinking about um, the interdisciplinary nature of our field. And that's something in, in both your answers, you touched upon gaining knowledge from other fields that we might not consider um, expressly archeological, but they're very um, adjacent, archeology span adjacent. And I was wondering if, if Mike, you can talk about, um, especially maybe with some of the places that you've worked, um, the, the specialist knowledge outside of archeology span that you draw upon to do the research that you do. Uh, sure, well, uh, I mean, archeology span is based on material culture. So it's, it's the things people use during their daily lives uh, basically, but, uh, but as an archaeologist, it's really a, a very, it's, it's a, a mixed discipline. It's, it, it, it can't really, it's not, a, not really a pure discipline. So uh, if you're an archaeologist, you know, you're using radiocarbon dates, which is, you know, work from, from physicists, you're using, uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, a lot about uh, landscape just now, uh, or, or, you know, coastlines and things like that. And so, uh, you know, you need geologists, you need, um, you know, biologists, if you're looking at organic material, reconstructing ancient environments, things like that. Uh, and uh, depending on the time period, you often have texts. So, so most of the uh, time periods we're talking about, we, we at least have a few texts, even back for the, the Bronze Age that mentioned seafaring, but uh, they're, they're very fragmentary and they're very difficult to interpret. So uh, historians uh, can play a major role too, because uh, uh, not all, you know, you, you need to have experts in ancient languages. You need to have people who can work in archives for later periods, uh, if you have archives. Uh, you know, people who can deal with inscriptions and, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, I mean, for, for my own, own work, I mean, we were talking about, uh, I mean, shipwrecks, for example. Uh, we've, we've worked uh, with some, uh, well, with the Jamal Pulax project at Yeni Cup, we worked on, uh, uh, we've had uh, wood specialists, our biologists, and, and uh, dendrochronologists who could do tree ring dating. So they took samples and uh, kind of, uh, are working these into a, a tree ring chronology. Uh, one of the interesting things about that is that actually told us that many of the ships there were built with very young timbers. Uh, and so uh, it's not great for uh, dendrochronological dating, unfortunately, but it tells us something about the environment from where they're getting their, their timber. And maybe that for the, the selection of timbers, uh, there's, there's a Dutch shipbuilding treatise where they say um, old trees are like old people, weak and brittle. So. I think it may have something to do with, uh, you know, the, the quality of timber also. This, this is something you kind of investigate with ethnographic work and, and, and uh, you know, talk to boat builders and things. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, you really, you, you have to rely on, on different experts. And, and I, I mean, that's, that's uh, one of the fun things about archaeology. I think you, you can't really uh, master it, or if you master it, it's going to be a really small, narrow thing. And then there's always other uh, areas you can work on and learn. And uh, so it has to be, I think it has to be interdisciplinary and it has to be cooperative because uh, if you're dealing with a site, uh, there's just, uh, you know, just lots of questions in different areas that uh, need answering, so. Great, yeah, exactly. And that's uh, something also that you touched upon, Matthew, is working in these different environments, um, the expertise that's needed. Yeah, indeed. And I agree with what Michael said. I mean, I find that my work is now engaging more with geologists, historians, you know, archival specialists. And another thing that I would want to emphasize is that when we're retrieving all this archaeological material data, we also need very specialized conservators who can stabilize, maintain, preserve this material so that we can continue to study it for decades. We also need museum conservators who can then put it into the museums and display all the work that we're doing for the public. Um, but I have to say that I think one of the more fun aspects of this interdisciplinary element of maritime archaeology for me has been working with, and this is this is for me, has been working with, say, engineers or, you know, sort of computer specialists who do IT or AR, VR kind of things. Because for me, it becomes particularly fun in that, like, I have an idea or I have a question, like, how can we collect this data? 
How can we find this information in this particular environment? Or how can we portray this change in seafaring activity over say three millennia? And then I can start to work with these individuals and we can find answers to those questions. And so for me, that's another element of archeology, span the interdisciplinary element that's necessary as Michael said that for me, I particularly enjoy that is that problem solving element and finding ways to really illustrate uh, what we find in our results to everyone else. Is, is there a, a publication maybe that you've produced or some research that maybe has not yet resulted in a publication where you've worked with somebody who uh, is not an archeologist, but, but working with them mm -hmm. has given you insight into something that and, until you discuss something with them or discuss the subject with them, um, you had no knowledge about, but once you got together, kind of the, the dynamics flowed and you could see, ah, this is opening doors, this is opening paths of inquiry that we, we didn't know existed, or maybe your, your colleague did, but you didn't know because that's not your area of expertise. Um, Matt, did you have an example of something like that? You can um, sure. Well, I can think about, there's a project I'm presently working on with a, with a group of AR, VR, augmented reality and virtual reality specialists here on campus. And it's, there's no brief way to explain it, so I won't try and do it. But very basically, uh, we're thinking about the ways that people are now very commonly creating these 3D photogrammetic models of material data. And it could be items in museums, it could be even shipwreck sites underwater. You can go to Sketchfab, for example, on the internet, and you can find dozens of these models that have been made. And one of the interesting things that has come out of this conversation that I've had with these AR VR specialists is that from their perspective, making these models is a technical process. How can we do it? How accurately can we make it? What sort of programs do we need? What sort of equipment do we need? I look at these models and I think to myself, did you get permission to do this? I'm thinking about legal and ethical issues. And so the conversations I've had with those individuals for a while, we were just going in completely different directions because the technical details are things I know nothing about. So I rely on them for that. But from their perspective, the legal issue is something that they have never encountered before. Because from their perspective, making photogrammetry models walking around in the world and just making models is just something they can do. So it became a very interesting conversation to try and explain or discuss that legal issue and how we have to be very careful when we're engaging with this archeological data and we're releasing or disseminating the results to the public. When, when you say legal uh, issues, um, could you be a, a little bit more descriptive and, and maybe for some people in the audience who don't know what that means when you take a, um, we're talking about not just intellectual property, although we are, but also kind of a, a more, um, uh, an even bigger issue that could be seen as cultural heritage property. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I don't want to give anyone the impression that these AR VR technicians were doing something that was illegal or they were breaking the law or doing something that was unethical. It's simply the fact that, well, very basically to answer your question, when we're dealing with archeological heritage, and this could be on land or it could be underwater, this is basically material data that can represent the country or the culture that it's based in. So when we're doing an archeological project in Turkey, for example, we need permission from the appropriate authorities to do that work because we're interacting with the heritage that represents the country of Turkey. And so, that's really the legal issues I'm talking about. And that veers into certain ethical issues because if this material represents the country, then we have to be very careful about how widely and perhaps where we're disseminating that information. So for example, I recently submitted an article to a professional journal for review. And within the article, I talked about how along this particular coastline, we found three sites of interest. And I put them on a map, but the map had a very big scale. 
But one of the reviewers who responded to the article said, well, what are the coordinates of these archeological sites underwater? And that's something that we just can't simply do. We can't provide that information because it creates a potential threat to the heritage. And so that's the sort of conversation that I find really interesting when I encounter individuals who don't have the same awareness that we do about the world. Yeah, and, and threats meaning there that they're underwater sites, they're not monitored maybe uh, on a daily basis. So that means that divers or sports divers are people who have uh, not so uh, good intentions are going to go to those sites and maybe take objects from those sites. Yeah, precisely. And it's, we could say it's looting, but it may not be looting in the sense that it's for destructive or monetary gain. It's looting because they're interested in the material. But yeah, that's really the reason we can't, you know, publicize the coordinates of everything. Right, right. Okay, uh, that's, that's a really good example of working with somebody or some people who are definitely not in the same field as you are and getting a, a perspective that affects your perspective on how you do your job, basically, or you do your research. And what about you, Mike? Have you had any experiences in your research or publications that you've worked on um, where you worked with uh, someone who kind of, uh, or research field that made you really go outside your, your comfort zone of archeology span to think about your field? Uh, I think most of them do that to, to some extent, I, I would say. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, hmm. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm very I'm very used to to the idea of, of, of consulting other people who are experts in their field, and I, I guess this was just how I, I was I was taught because it's 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 such a, I mean these are these are large fields I mentioned with the you know dendrochronologists and and uh, uh, you know so experts for that, and so if for, if you're on an archaeological site, you know you have experts on pottery, you have experts on architecture, you have experts in and. You know various other things. We had a, a geologist um, on another project, so uh, you know. So it's it's, uh, and uh, you know, I've asked for for help with translation on on Latin ins or Greek inscriptions and things like that. So, uh, which is not always very straightforward. Uh, so yeah, it's it's uh, for archaeology. It really does have to be uh, uh, collaborative that way, and uh, for a lot of my. I mean, for my work, for my dissertation onwards, especially, it, it's been uh, a lot in the early, you know late antiquity and the early medieval period. So you have a certain number of texts, but uh, they're definitely not easy to interpret. And if you're looking at material for uh, for maritime trade or the economy or things like that in general, uh, it can, there's there's material there, but it's it's in texts that are com on completely different subjects. And you know, people will mention just as asides that they were traveling and how they traveled and things like that. But uh, you know, you look at saints' lives or, or things like that, or political accounts where they talk about diplomats traveling in the winter uh, or, or things like that. So, uh, uh, which uh, uh, in, in a lot of uh, kind of older uh, works, people say you know that the, the sea was closed in the winter because of bad weather in the Mediterranean. But there's actually many accounts where they're, they're doing that. So, uh, so. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, if you want to understand, you know, you know, you're dealing with biased textual sources. So you want to talk to a historian and say, okay, how might these be biased? Who, who's writing these? Are they all, you know, priests and clergymen? And, you know, what, what, what are their, what are the controversies in their time that might make them say this or that? And so that, that's, that's particularly important about, uh, I guess, uh, anything that attaches to, to politics or kind of large scale uh, economic trade and things. So, uh, yeah, and we, we deal a lot with where we're looking at the, you know, the, the experiences of what it means to be human and looking, as you said, Mike, at the material culture of everyday life. Um, but it also, we're in so many instances having to deal with these remains of everyday life being in, in vastly different environments. Mm -hmm. And that's also, I think, in our field has come in and uh, made us really be aware of um, not just putting our heads down and focusing on the artifacts themselves, but also thinking about how has the environment impacted this, this uh, object I'm looking at, or how is this environment uh, different than it was then when people were here? Um, you mentioned the submerged um, area um, between uh, what is now um, no longer part of the EU, England, 
uh, in the EU. Um, as King Henry VIII said, England is but a small island off of Europe, and I think that still sticks. Um, Doggerland is this huge submerged area in the North Sea that a lot of uh, marine archaeologists and marine geologists uh, work together to, to study the environment. Um, Matthew, you have a project in Italy right now that you're working with marine geologists. And what, what are they looking for specifically that's relevant to your research? Well, the broad question that we're trying to do with these uh, geologists is we simply want to know how the sea level has changed over the past millennia. Was it higher, was it lower, that sort of thing. Because once we know that, we can start to get a better sense of how the coastline, how that silhouette has changed, which then gives us more information about how the communities along this coastline may have been interacting with the sea itself. So you can say we're using a whole lot of what's called proxy data because we can't actually understand what the communities themselves were doing. We have to interpret it a lot. But what these uh, geologists have explained to me and what, again, is really interesting is that they're not simply looking for evidence of where the sea level may have eroded the rock, but they're actually looking at the, oh gosh, the various types of microfauna that are preserved within these places that have been carved out of the bedrock because that microfauna can tell us how long the sea level may have been at that may have been at this particular point. So if they find these microfauna in one of these kind of carved out incisions on the bedrock and it could indicate that the sea level was at this point for a millennium or two, or it might indicate it was there for a very brief time. Now, unfortunately, it's very hard to find these microfauna as well. So we're finding a lot of these nice incisions in the bedrock, but we have to start coordinating that with other examples elsewhere along the coastline. And it just continues to be a lot of, you could say, educated guessing. I mean, the results are very interesting, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, these, these like you're saying, these notches and things you're looking for, it's their indicators that, um, indicate it's a kind of the wave, the sea level basically eats away at the rock and creates these notches. And so you can determine sea levels, um, maybe not absolutely, but relatively to, to where you are today. And especially in the area where you're working in the Bay of Naples, um, there's a lot of uh, incredible seismic activity, not just um, tectonic activity, but also volcanism that's created a lot of changes to the environment. One of the sites that's very fascinating in the Bay of Naples, aside from Pompeii and Herculaneum, of course, we all are familiar with, but I'm thinking more um, to the west of, uh, of Naples is a site called Baiae, which is a, a, was a, a major Roman uh, settlement, um, kind of the, the Miami beach of, uh, of ancient Italy, right? At the time, the first centuries BC and, and AD, and now because of what's called Vradiism or Vradi seismism, which is kind of, it's, it's not so much, tech, it is tectonic shifting, but it's this kind of slow shifting. Um, the site of Baiae is now five, six meters underwater. So you can actually go and dive on these, yeah. these villas um, that are underwater. Um, so we're thinking that's a radical change of only 2000 years that we're talking about. And then marine geologists there have also um, looked at these microorganisms that have eaten the marble statues that were there, uh, the, the stonework and then things like that, that or the villas were built in to really get a sense of, of how things have changed over time. So it's, it's wildly informative to work with, with these groups. And I'm wondering if you can both say something about knowing what we know about um, these kind of past environments and how people moved uh, from safety uh, between ports and maybe not so safely between ports, um, what that can mean for the future. What, what kind of uh, concepts or ideas maybe um, are you willing to, to think about that could give us an idea of, of how people could um, kind of uh, take as a a conclusion of how past societies reacted to certain environmental changes, um, what that can mean for future environmental uh, changes that we could be facing. 
Mm. That's a, I know a huge topic. We could spend a whole <laughs> seminar talking about that, but just um, especially in the coastal zone where we we have you were both working in and two really significant coastal sites, what that might mean for you and your research. Mike, would you like to, to jump on this one first? Go for it, Michael. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's that's a big question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's on a lot of people's minds, I think we're thinking about climate change and, and there's a lot on uh, social collapse. Uh, I mean, they, we had some uh, on amid uh, sessions earlier in the year about the, the seventh century uh, uh, crisis in the Byzantine Empire and that sort of thing. And there are differences in, uh, in, in there, there's some climate related data on that, but it's very ambiguous what that actually means and different from region to region. Um, I think, yeah, if, if you're looking at the ancient world, it's, it's, uh, uh, climate doesn't, doesn't, uh, uh, explain things on its own, but, uh, it can give us some kind of models for what happens when, when things go wrong with climate, if that, that makes sense. So I, I think, uh, for a lot of places, if, if it's already sort of a, a marginal area, uh, and something changes in the climate or it gets a little bit worse, it is a little less for food supply, uh, that causes, you know, migration and people move and, and uh, you know, that can cause war and unrest and refugees and, and that sort of thing. So um, uh, I, I think also, yeah, I mean, we, we can see how, you know, societies don't always uh, collapse in a dramatic way, but uh, sometimes we, we, you have something like the 1200 BC collapse at, at the end of the Bronze Age. You have, you know, a lot of you know these this kind of palace economies collapse, but uh, a lot of other places uh, don't. So you know, you lose texts and things in Greece. So, uh, so I don't know. That's it's a very general question, but I think you can look at history and, and look at uh, or kind of archaeology in earlier periods and see that uh, you really have to look at these things region by region. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So. We don't always have good data as the other things. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's a whole nother uh, topic, right? For a whole nother. Yeah. Topic. Yeah. What about you, Matthew? What what do you think about when you think about maybe bringing the, the kind of forward what what you're finding in in your own research? I was I was hoping I could get out of this one. Um, let me think. Well, what well, some examples I'm thinking of is that. Oh, geez, I don't quite know where to start. Well, as I mentioned previously, one of the benefits or luxuries almost of doing archaeology underwater is the preservation of organic material. So we, as I mentioned, we have leather, we have bones, but we also have all that wood from the hulls themselves. And I'm afraid I can't remember all the specifics, but I know that individuals have been looking at the activities of Teredo novalis, which are commonly known as shipworms. It's a mollusk that basically just eats all the wood. And if anyone here or watching has ever worked on a site underwater or happened to see any of the wood that we recover, you know, it's commonly described as Swiss cheese because there can just be holes. These mollusks will just dig tunnels through the wood. They just eat and eat and eat. But these wonderful studies have begun, I think, in the past decade, in which they're looking at both the size and you could say the prevalence of these uh, shipworms within the archeological record, within that data. So if we look at a shipwreck from the Bronze Age, if we look at one from the Roman period or from the Byzantine period or the 15th century, how active are these shipworms? And what's helpful is that these shipworms live within particular environments. So if the temperature is too high or too low, they don't like it. If the salinity is too high or too low, they don't like it. So these are fauna that can actually explain how the environment of the sea has changed over time. Because we can see how prevalent they are in certain periods in the past, which gives us an idea of the temperature and the solidity of the Mediterranean or perhaps the North Sea and how much that has changed. So I don't think we can accurately project what this is gonna tell us over the next decade or two decades, but I think what we can safely predict is that things are getting warmer and that you know things are not getting better. I mean, I think similar to what Michael said, we can also see how people and societies 
have reacted to disasters in the past? You know, how did they deal with floods? How did they deal with massive tsunamis coming onto the land? When they, at Yeni Kappa, for example, when they absolutely destroyed a harbor structure. So we can look at that and we can learn from these examples in the past. And I think they're very good reminders that, you know, when we see that there are luxury houses in the Roman period built along a coastline, they're going to sink into the water, just like luxury houses built on a coastline in California or Florida or North Carolina. The same thing will continue to happen. And I suppose that's just a reminder. It's a warning. As they say, we can always learn from the past. Yeah, that's a really good point about coastlines and uh, especially now as we're, we're getting into sea level rise and, and changes. And um, I also, what you're talking about shipworm reminds me of thinking about um, the environments they live in. They're more prevalent, of course, you said in warm environments, more saline environments. So they're, they're very common in the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean. And I remember having started working in the Mediterranean I didn't really see that much uh, wood from shipwrecks or harbor structures at all. And until I got to the North Sea and started diving here um, in Copenhagen, um, diving in the North Sea and uh, in the Baltic. And um, I remember coming up from one of my first dives thinking, I've never seen that much wood underwater before. This is amazing. They don't live here. Right. But within the time I've been here 20 years, they're starting to come into the Baltic. So things are changing environmentally. So, so wood that was preserved, archeological wood is now being affected by shipworm. So this is something to think about um, as a consequence of, of more saline water and a little bit more warmer water temperatures globally. Um, so moving on maybe to a little bit um, more relaxed uh, atmosphere here and not so um, doom and gloom, let's maybe go back and think about how do we actually do maritime archeology? span There's a lot of different sites that you talked about, um, different environments. There's also different goals of your research. So I'm, I'm curious about how you do maritime archeology. span um, And one of uh, our audience, she already asked a question about, um, do the methods and processes differ um, between nautical archeology span she asked also between maritime archaeology, would you think there's different methods and processes that maybe define those, those fields um, or your definition of those fields? Um, so uh, maybe uh, Matthew, would you like to, to go ahead and talk about um, maybe the differences between um, surveys and excavations? Um, and and why, why would you do a survey underwater versus doing an excavation? And well, uh, I suppose the, uh, the idealized version is that I like to think of archaeology as a science. Or you could say that we proceed in a scientific method. So we start with a hypothesis or an idea, and then we go into the field to collect data to test that idea. So fundamentally, that's why we're doing all this research outside. That's why we're swimming around. That's why we're talking to people. That's why it looks like we're going on a vacation when in fact we are actually doing archeological work along some beautiful areas because we need to collect data to answer these questions. And so from my perspective, the question and the way we want to collect the data then determines if we're going to do a survey or if we're going to do an excavation. So for example, a lot of what we've spoken about today has been ships and shipwrecks. And indeed, if you look through a lot of books about maritime archeology, span shipwrecks you know, predominate within all the images. Now, if we're going to ask a question such as, how was the ship built? You know, because there's a bigger issues about changes in technology, we really need to excavate that entire ship to understand how it was built because we have to pull out all the parts of the hull and we have to examine each part piece by piece. But we might be asking different questions. We might be asking how people are relate, working with the sea. We might be asking how maritime activity along a particular coastline has changed over time. And so in that situation, we don't necessarily need to do an excavation as much as we need to collect a broad sample of data 
that could be coming from a variety of different periods of time. So for something like that, we're doing what you could basically call to what you could basically call a surface survey. We're simply looking at what is present on the surface of the seafloor, and we're we're trying to understand where it came from and its date. And that too can start to give us answers to those questions. And what about you, Mike? Would you have anything to add to thinking about surveys and excavations of the methodology there, or maybe touch upon maybe the methods that could be different in nautical archaeology versus maritime archaeology? Do you think there's a difference? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of overlap. I think maritime archaeology, you may look more at uh, coastlines and may look more at, at settlements a, a bit. But uh, I mean, this, this seems to be a uh, a little bit of a source of disagreement even with experts. So uh, I mean, one, one approach I guess you could talk about is looking at maritime landscapes versus ships. And, and so that's uh, like uh, Christo uh, Westerdahl's uh, article. He has an article from the 1990s where he talks about this. And uh, the idea is that uh, you, know, you should look at the, the, the landscape of coastlines uh, uh, in that way, as, as, a, as you know, as a, as a space that people live in, and uh, not just look at, at shipwrecks when you're doing surveys. So where where the you know promontories are, you can use for navigation, where people stop, where people fish, and, and things like that. So that that's a little more of a, a maritime perspective. But there's a lot of uh, overlap, and uh, I guess I would say perhaps uh, if you're doing more kind of shoreline surveys. Of, of settlement areas and things like that, that's perhaps a little more uh, maritime rather than, than nautical, because uh, if, if nautical is a little more specialized and, and directly related to ships and ships equipment and facilities for ships. Uh, but uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of overlap, I'd say. Uh, so. Great, and then how, how do you go about finding something underwater? Um, and doing these surveys, what would you, what are the, the techniques that you would use? Um, I mean, you had the luck, Mike, of working. Ask, the ask the sponge divers, I think, was the yeah. <laughs> fishermen, ask the locals. <laughs> if they like you, they'll tell you. Uh, that's that's probably the, the, the best way to do it. I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, survey methods. I mean, you can, uh, if you're looking for, it depends on what you're looking for, I guess, and you need to have a very, uh, uh, close observation or, or good knowledge of, of the local region, and so you can you can plan surveys for areas and and uh, try to decide. You know, if you if you know there's ancient settlements in the area, you can uh, look at places where you might find uh, you know the particular types of sites you're looking for. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you said, I was lucky to you know be involved in an accidental <laughs> find. Uh, so. Uh, it, it really depends. It's, it's, it's very, it's kind of uh, wide open uh, how you want to approach that. And how, how about, uh, Matthew, the, the kind of technologies or the, that you would use to, to go about finding sites underwater if you're doing surveys? So in other words, I mean, I agree with Michael's initial response, like ask the spun divers, ask the fishermen. Uh, because these are people that spend their lives interacting with the seabed, so they know where this material is. But if we're not going to go on that route, which I wouldn't advise, but if you're not, um, there's a whole variety of technology and techniques that we can use. And it depends upon partially the questions you're asking, but also the environment you're working in and how deep you may want to work underwater. So, for example, the work that we're doing off the coast of Italy and indeed, a lot of the work we're doing here in Turkey, it's in, you could say, relatively shallow water. We're working in water where, or rather, we're doing the surveys uh, less than 30 meters deep. So in that sense, we can do this work with scuba equipment. I mean, part of the work we did this summer in Turkey with the University of Ankara was in water that was four meters deep. There's a great site off the coast of Israel that was in water that was so shallow that the divers could literally stand up and talk to each other when they had questions. So uh, in some cases, you can do a lot of work with scuba equipment simply because the water can be very shallow and the visibility is good, the temperature is not particularly cold and the conditions themselves might not be dangerous. 
but you could be working in other areas in which the water is very cold, it's very deep, it's the visibility is awful. And in that case, I would start using remote sensing equipment, such as a magnetometer that could detect anomalies in the magnetic field. You could use sub uh, bottom profilers, which actually can determine what's in the seabed up to, I think maybe four or five meters deep. We could also use a side scan sonar, which will give us a picture of what's on the seabed as well. So it really depends upon, again, the environment that you're working in. But all of these methods, I think, are available to individuals and they can give a variety of different answers to what we're looking for. Exactly, and like the, the what you, those techniques that you mentioned, the methods you just mentioned being remote sensing, um, meaning not, you know, not personally being there, but you're, you're sending equipment to do the survey for you are also really great for, like you said, cold environments, deep environments, but also they can cover a large area that just with visual diver survey, you're limited by how much air you have and how deep you can go. There's some limitations there that remote sensing really doesn't have, which is fantastic because it can cover a large area and, and rather economically, even though it can yeah. be expensive, economically for, for a human effort, yeah. uh, little manpower. And I'm, I'm thinking when you talk about cold and dark and I'm thinking about the amazing work they've done with having um, multi-beam sonars and, and side scan sonars and video on um, ROBs, so remotely operated vehicles uh, that can go down very deep. And there's been a project in the Black Sea. Yeah. Uh, John Adams had a project in the Black Sea from the University of Southampton, um, where they found amazingly preserved uh, shipwrecks from uh, all the way from the Hellenistic classical period onwards um, that are what, 300, 400 meters deep in some cases. Um, and they found those through using remote sensing means. So divers would never ever scuba divers would never ever be able to access these sites, yet they're able through remote sensing to collect this amazing data. It's yeah. useful to a lot of, uh, lot of different uh, people. So that's, that's a good example of, of how we use different technologies in our field. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything specific, Mike, when you worked on, on Yenikapa, that's a completely different site. We've been talking about underwater being out in the sea um, when you were working on land at Yenikapa, I mean, you had some other challenges there, aside from being in the middle of a major urban center and uh, everything else. <laughs> were there some special techniques that you used uh, working on this site? Um, yeah, you could you could say so. It's less less high tech, I guess. But uh, I mean, what the advantage was you could use uh, uh, techniques of terrestrial archaeology for a lot of what we were doing. So basically we map the ships using a total station. So it kind of uh, shoots a laser reflector and kind of measure specific points. Uh, you can make kind of a 3D point cloud out of that and uh, whatever, you know, map, map the ships in situ. So before you take them apart. Uh, I, I think the main thing that we did that I suppose was um, sort of innovative or experimenting is if you have a shipwreck on land like that, you have a few options. Uh, you can try to take it out in one piece, you can cut it up into sections, or you can dismantle it completely. And uh, we, we chose generally to dismantle them completely. And I think that was, uh, it, it's the best in terms of, of learning how they're, they're built, first of all, uh, at some point, but uh, it was also, uh, I guess more convenient for the situation because it's a it's a construction site. We did have access to a lot of construction workers, uh, but otherwise, uh, so kind of putting the individual pieces in boxes after the the hull's been mapped and we've we've documented the curvatures and that sort of thing is is uh, very useful. And then you can kind of ship it off somewhere else to uh, uh, you know out of the way of the construction to do the uh, the post excavation documentation, which is. Uh, um, actually, something we should emphasize in a lot of these projects is that uh, there's a lot of post-excavation work that goes into any anything that's excavated, especially. So surveys, you can sometimes kind of bang out something relatively quickly in terms of you know, publishing your results. But for excavations, for any underwater material, waterlogged material, it requires conservation. Something like a shipwreck takes you know, usually many years to kind of document properly and get all the information uh, from it. So uh so that, that they're 
that that's something to consider for kind of research design and things like that. You need to have the facilities and the expertise sort of lined up to uh, to do that. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. It's, 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 we're talking about the, the going out and doing the, the field work, which is always really exciting because you're discovering new data, but then you've got to deal with the, the consequences of your field work, mm-hmm. which is much longer and much more involved. Uh, right. which we've, we've seen uh, many projects, archaeological projects, not just maritime, but also terrestrial. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm now we're going to wrap up a little bit here, and, and on the way out the door, I wanted to ask you both why uh, why did you become interested in maritime archaeology? What was the the uh, driving interest for you to get into the field? I guess I, I could start. I guess. Yes, yeah, I wanna, <laughs> yeah. oh, I Matthew looks like he's in deep thought. So I'll, yeah, I'll okay, sure, that, sure. Actually, this represents me avoiding the question. Uh. <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I always had a lot of uh, books in my house as a kid, and we had all the National Geographics, and so I do remember the, the Uliburan uh, article, and I think it's 88, 89, so mm-hmm. it was, was very, that made a big impression, uh, and uh, when I was an undergraduate, I uh, was an archaeology major, but a, l- a little aimless, and I, I took a course with uh, Anna Marguerite McCann, who was teaching at, uh, was at Boston University. So she taught there for a semester. And uh, I guess that, that kind of solidified a lot of things there because I realized it's something you can actually do as a job. And then also a lot of the really the wrecks I found particularly interesting were, were at Texas A&M University excavations. And then I was like, oh yeah, Uber. And uh, so I applied there and that was kind of uh, how I got into it. And so I started working with uh, Jamal Pulak, who worked on the uh, excavated the Ulubrun shipwreck. And uh, we kind of accidentally got involved with the Unicapa project. So, uh, and yeah, then, uh, yeah, okay. And that's, yeah, and Marguerite McCann, just for those who, who don't know, she is, she was, she excavated Coza in Italy, a very important port site north of Rome, and then also uh, kind of put deep water or uh, open water archaeology on the map with the Skirky Bank uh, project That's between uh, Sicily and Tunisia, which is now the, the subject of a major investigation, a cooperative investigation between uh, Italy and Tunisia. Matthew, have you had time to think about what bit you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I suppose it was a combination of things, much like Michael. Uh, there were, I had a few opportunities when I was young to actually to go sailing one or once or twice. And I suppose that really engaged me. Like that was just wonderful, the experience. It's like, how does this work and how does this operate? And so there was this initial interest in sailing and boats. And then at some point when I was in university, I started learning more about a, um, an individual named Richard Steffi, who was also at Texas A&M. And he was a person who, well, his training, he was an electrical engineer, an electrical contractor, excuse me, but he built uh, boats, model boats as a hobby. And he eventually moved that into a career of making model boats of ancient boats. And so he ended up working with individuals like George Bass, Frederick Van Dornick, Michael Katzev, all of these individuals that have excavated these important sites. And so by the time I got to university, I found out that, you know, oh my gosh, someone studies these ancient boats for a living and it's archaeology and this is just amazing. And I think that was a lot of it. It was really just this fascination with boats and ships and how they work. And later on, it became an issue of problem solving. And I think that's what still engages me now is if I have this question, how can I find the data to answer it? How can I find the people I need to collaborate with to get these answers? And, you know, how do we go in the field and find, you know, these little microfauna in the rock to tell us where the sea level was? How do we find the stuff underwater? So I think that's what still engages me now. And it's interesting that the people that you mentioned there um, all were very instrumental in the Karenia shipwreck excavation in the late 60s off the coast of Northern Cyprus. And that's the project that you ended up working on in Cyprus as well, years later, helping, uh, you know, after that shipwreck was excavated, a very seminal excavation, Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, working on uh, the project to help make sure that the shipwreck still is conserved and in one piece or as many pieces as it can be, uh, but not more than that uh, in, in the future. So that's, it's all kind of comes full circle. Um, and the same with Mike is, is working with Jamal and Ulubro and it's, uh, and that I think illustrates also the um, small world of, of maritime archaeology. It is a, a small discipline um, and a, a small uh, network of, of people, um, but working together and kind of having different relationships. Um, moving now, and we said second, maybe we're the third generation of practitioners in the field uh, and where it can go um, from there. So um, with that, I want to ask also where, um, where can one study maritime archaeology? Um, you're both sitting in Istanbul, so that could give us a clue. Um, but, but where, if, if one wants to develop the specialized interest, where can one go? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do this one. Um, I suppose it depends upon what the individual's goals are, because there are some places where within a university setting, an individual could take an undergraduate or graduate courses within maritime archaeology. And those may be fairly broad, but then it starts to narrow down if an individual wants to receive postgraduate training or a degree within the discipline, for example. So if someone wants to receive a master's or a PhD, then the number of universities or programs around the world diminishes dramatically. I think there are perhaps a dozen, but that's really just a number off the top of my head. Um, and so, for example, yes, we have uh, training here at Coach University. And so individuals will take uh, courses on maritime archaeology but they will also be receiving training in archeology, span cultural heritage training, uh, museums, and that sort of thing. Other places like Texas A&M, where the three of us attended, you can receive much more specialized training within nautical archeology. span But there are also programs in Israel, in Australia, in Italy, in the United Kingdom, in North Carolina. I think it's possible to find a program almost on almost every continent in the world at this point. Is there anything, Mike, that you want to add to that? Uh, if, if you're a student and you have this question, you can send me an email. I'll give you yes. a real opinion <laughs> and, uh, you know, tell me what your interests are. I can tell you your options. How's that? <laughs> because there, there are, it, yeah, it depends partly on what you're interested in. And, uh, you know, if you have an idea of what you want to study and if so, where and, uh, you know, what type of work you want to do or, you know, what, what your options are. So. It's, it's, uh, but we have a program here in Istanbul at Coach University. So if you want to uh, do uh, Mediterranean maritime archaeology or work in Turkey, uh, this is a, this is a, you know, an option. So. And just to, to finish, uh, finish off before we go into some questions is, can you very uh, briefly, um, We've, we've talked about different sites and shipwrecks, but you personally, what is your favorite find of your career thus far? Um, Matthew, you wanna answer that one? Um, I think mine is rather, it might sound really boring to other people, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, for my PhD research, I had the opportunity to investigate a, the hull of a shipwreck from the ninth century AD which meant that for summers and summers, I had to basically draw broken pieces of wood. And at one point I found a piece of wood, it was part of the planking of the ship and it was a piece of pine timber that was about this big. So it was really nothing consequential. All the sides were broken. I think there might've been an original edge at one point, but I knew basically where this piece fit in the overall ship. And this particular piece of pine planking had two nail holes in it. And one nail hole went all the way through the plank and the other nail hole was only went in maybe a centimeter at the most. And I just looked at that and I knew that whomever was building this ship made a mistake. I just looked at it and I knew it. It's like they had the piece of wood on the side of the ship and they set up the nail and they hammered it like twice. And then they thought, oh God, that's the wrong place. And I can just picture them like pulling it out, going like 
10 centimeters over here, and then they just hammered it right into place. And I always, I always liked that one because to me, it really reminded me that I'm looking at the, something that was built by people. I'm really looking at this human-made, original, completely unique object. And it reminded me that that's what I should be thinking about is the people who made this as opposed to, you know, how big the planking is or, you know, how long the keel was. So I always remember that little piece, that, that bit of wood. And what about you, uh, Mike, uh, from, do you also have favorite little pieces of wood or do you have other objects? <laughs> I have a lot of favorite little pieces of wood because <laughs> that's what he's talking about. I know exactly what he's talking about because you have misdrilled holes and they, they they you know plug it up with grass or pitch or you know there's a there's a you know wormholes that are repaired or split open on planks and things like that. So so yeah, so that that's that is one of the the fun things about working on on ship hulls and. Um, uh, I guess yeah. So I guess for something a, a slightly different answer, I'd also say I. I, I very fond of, of big iron concretions from shipwrecks. So you get the, the metal starts corroding. So when I was in graduate school, um, I worked at the, the uh, Conservation Research Laboratory at Texas A&M. And one of the things they put me on is they had the, the little bell shipwreck, the 17th century uh, you know, French explorer. His ship went down in uh, Matagorda Bay. Uh, it's, it's quite a horror story. Everybody, there's only like six survivors from the whole thing. But uh, uh, early on, they lose their supply ship. And so uh, one of the things I was working on uh, as a, you know, sort of for my basically research assistantship was to um, do conservation work on these big iron blobs. It's all iron corrosion products. And, it, and inside you have the hollow molds of uh, pieces of basically ship's hardware. So big ring bolts and, and the chain plates, which are used for holding up the mast. And, and uh, it, it's so you're using an air scribe, which is like a little jackhammer to kind of dig into them. and uh, so it can kind of uh, uh, knock off little bits at a time. So you can you can kind of excavate, but it's very delicate, and uh, and it was just that was just a lot of fun. And uh, it's 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 messy work. You find things in there. You, know, you can do an X-ray of these things. And you say, you know, what's that? There's there's lead shot and copper pins and glass beads inside, and and uh, and then you end up sometimes just casting them in epoxy. Uh, if the, the iron's not gone and if it's not, you have to make a, you know, silico mold to make a replica because the iron can corrode later. And so, so uh, that, that whole process was, was a lot of fun. And uh, it, it's, it was sort of a combination of uh, stimulating, but also sort of relaxing because it's, it's uh, you know, you're kind of planning out the next stages of, of how to deal with it. And, and uh, yeah, every now and then you, you find something interesting because I, I worked on the, um, uh, the gudgeon straps for, for the rudder, and it was just in a big blob of concretion. So it was from kind of further up in the hull. So there's actually, it just looks like this, this weird blob, but it was uh, an important piece of the ship. So, so, so that was fun. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's the, the little bitty pieces and maybe the, the not so sexy pieces that also are uh, reminders to us of the human element that we're, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And we're, yeah. at the end of the day, going back to and studying. So I'm gonna, I think that's all the questions I have for you. Um, we do have some audience questions and um, if we can stay on for a few more minutes, um, I'm gonna, this question's a bit long, so I'm just gonna paraphrase, but one of our, our audience is asking about collaboration and working uh, in different environments. So uh, a lot of the projects we discussed here, um, we've all worked on projects where we've, we've uh, um, been in the US or we've been in Turkey or we've been in Italy, um, uh, the UK. How do you, um, to think about uh, collaboration between um, you as working at Coach University, you were working on a project in Italy, maybe Matthew, you could explain how you go about building some of those relationships or uh, foreign, I could say foreign projects, foreign missions um, working on in different uh, countries, um, Turkey being one, others being Italy or uh, Bulgaria or Spain or Morocco, things like this. Could you give some insight into how that process is and, and maybe discuss how, how it kind of logistically functions? Uh, well, I think as is probably clear to everyone listening and as we've explicitly mentioned, maritime archaeology itself is a relatively small discipline. 
So if, for example, like the work I've been doing in Italy now has been greatly helped and facilitated by maritime archeologists within Italy, like Chiara Zazzaro, for example, she's been extraordinarily helpful. But I never actually met Chiara in person before she started helping me, which was incredibly generous of her. I was actually introduced to her by another colleague. And she's and, a maritime archeologist uh, based at the University uh, Lorentale in Naples. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So I think that element is similar to um, many other environments. You know, you simply find a colleague, you find an individual who shares your interests and shares your you know, goals, and then you find a way of working together to achieve those goals. But that's on a very, how can I say, that's a kind of a low level of interaction and collaboration. That's at the personal level. So Kiata is helping us in that way. But I think there's also a very big question here because when I'm doing the work in Italy, or for example, when individuals from the United States are working in Turkey or they're working elsewhere in the Mediterranean, it's not just an individual relationship. There's also the fact that we are representing another country. And so there's also this issue of kind of countries collaborating. There's this issue of how can we maintain this collaboration despite potential conflicts or despite potential tensions. And what I suppose advice I would like, advice I'm going to give, but I don't know if it's ever going to be taken, is that I think very often a lot, there are times where we have individuals from the United States or we have the United States as an entity doing work in the Mediterranean and they're continually and rightly so celebrating all of this incredible cultural heritage and the material. But I think so, something reciprocal would be quite valuable. You know, what sort of opportunities are there for archaeologists from the Mediterranean to come to the U.S. and to do similar work? If we're going to be continually creating these traveling exhibitions of Mediterranean heritage that are going around the United States, can something reciprocal be created so that American heritage or heritage from North America is being displayed somewhere in the Mediterranean? So there's an equivalency there. It's not just an issue of, you know, these people from outside the Mediterranean coming in, working for two weeks or a month or a summer and then leaving. Like, I think there's always that issue of soft diplomacy. There's always that issue of cultural diplomacy, making sure that we can maintain these relations and that equivalency over a long time. Great. Mike, would you like to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's it's important to be uh, respectful because you're, you know, you're a guest in another country and uh, just uh, you may not know everything. So that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's important. So, so your, your attitude means uh, matters a lot. Uh, so, uh, and uh, just, just pay very close attention and, and uh, uh, yeah, just, just uh, be able to, uh, and con conduct yourself in a way that's that's uh, you won't be embarrassed by later. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. So it's it's uh, and, and I mean in terms of well, one thing I like about I think for the, the academic world sometimes it, it can be you know everybody knows each other it can be insular there can be uh, kind of uh, personal conflicts and things but uh, a lot of people do have a very you know international outlook and they're not just going to. Uh, uh, judge you by, you know, prejudices about your nation or something like that, or, or, or what your government is doing versus what, uh, you know, uh, you know, they, they understand is a little more nuanced to that. So, so I think if you can give people some credit too, that they, they might have a reason for being skeptical of, yeah. of, of people coming from outside. So, um, yeah. Yeah. We've all kind of been in that situation where we maybe at certain point in times, so, uh, you know, the governments above our heads aren't, aren't, uh, cooperating or, or liking each other, but uh, everyday uh, interaction between cultures and peoples continue and, and they right. tend to see the, the long view and the bigger picture. Right, right. Because because if we do what we're doing well, it can last much longer past these, you know, political disputes and, and things. Right. That's so that's what I try to aim for. So. Right. Right. Uh, I don't see any more questions in our chat. Um, if somebody would like to ask 
uh, something, now's the time to do it. Um, but if we don't see anything pop up in the next few seconds or so, um, I think this will be the end of our talk today. And um, I'm going to hand uh, it over to Natalie after I thank Mike and Matthew for their time and for their thoughts and opinions and introducing us to the world of maritime archeology. span yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for uh, moderating. Yeah, thank you for your help and thank you, Natalie, for organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, it really gave, uh, gave us um, a precious um, information about the maritime archaeology. And when Athena, you were asking Michael and Matthew about why have you chosen um, maritime archaeology. I was asking myself, how did I miss this? <laughs> so, um, so I hope that this talk triggered a um, significant amount of interest within, uh, within our audience, especially the students. Um, as Michael has said, you may write uh, to, to our speakers if you have any questions. And um, and I hope that it also gave some collaboration ideas um, to, to, to the scholars who are uh, attending those, this talk or, um, or will be watching uh, on our YouTube channel when the recording is on. Um, so thank you all once more. And um, dear attendees, um, our library, Animal Library Talks are continuing next month as well. Uh, and our next guest will be Lucien Chanojak uh, from Koch University. Uh, the talk is entitled Medical and Health Humanities Initiatives. So uh, have a good evening and see you at the next talk. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.